There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of a wonderful collection of photography and true stories about Indigenous communities in Canada. Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun, Portraits of Everyday Life in Eight Indigenous Communities by Paul C. Sequasis. Published 2020. A beautiful book that has touched my heart. A combination of photograph and text. Paul C. Sequasis is a Saskatoon, Saskatchewan-based member of the Willow Cree tribe in what is now Saskatchewan, a writer and photo documentarian. I think he's probably got, he wears other hats as well. Let me give you some context for how Paul C. Sequasis's project arose. In Canada, and I believe also in the United States, for more than 100 years, the government created religious-run residential schools for Indigenous children basically kidnapping them from their parents and putting them into these residential schools where religious orders, Catholic and other denominations, tried to teach the Indian out of them with all kinds of abuse, sexual, physical, you name it. Just the most unbelievable genocidal abuse was perpetrated on generations and generations of these indigenous children that, you know, after 10 years were thrown out and where were their parents and did they remember their parents? I mean, it was just absolutely horrific. Nazi Germans studied what was going on in Canada with their indigenous people to get some pointers. No lie. Recently, Canada has got a bare start on coming to terms with this deep, deep stain on our country. And there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that maybe finished up its report about five or so years ago. And so a lot of the horrific stories came out for the first time. Paul C. Sequasis' mother was a residential school survivor, and she was overwhelmed by the horror of all the stories that came out. She had her own story, but the mass of trauma that came out during those hearings was just too much. And she said to her son, Paul C. Sequasis, I don't want the happy stories about our lives. We weren't all murdered. We did survive. Some of us thrived. A lot of us had happy times. And that gave her son the idea to start finding photographs taken by Indigenous photographers and non-Indigenous photographers of community life across eight different Indigenous communities from maybe the early 20th century right up until close to the present. And he utilized social media ingeniously and was able to put names because of the people on social media saying, oh, that's my grandma. He was able to identify most of the people in the pictures and then find out the stories of the people. And the result is this gorgeous book full of photographs and stories. Do I want to say accentuating the positive? Maybe I would say accentuating the positive as a counterbalance that you need to read within the context of the genocidal horrors these peoples survived. I just loved it so much. It just made me realize how stupid I am as a white settler Canadian. I didn't know very much about many of these communities, and I learned so much from this book. There's very little by way of political focus or historical. It's mostly, here is a picture of this guy, and here is what his life was like. Interspersed with profiles of the photographers. The eight communities, this is not meant to be comprehensive. I hope that he will put out many more like this, but this is just a smattering of photographs and uh, portraits of communities. But the portraits are of Cape Dorset, Nunavik, James Bay, Hudson Bay Watershed, Saskatchewan, Montana and Alberta, because of course they didn't care about the, the stupid colonialist border. Northwest Territories and Yukon Territory. And I knew a little bit about the Saskatchewan and Alberta, maybe, but I knew next to nothing about these other communities, and it was just an absolute delight to sink into these stories and imagine myself into the photos. 
Sisequesis does not steer clear of the politics of the genocidal reality that these peoples lived and live under. I was freshly outraged to read about the James Bay communities of Cree peoples that starting in the 60s and 70s started trying to mount opposition to or at least negotiate a fair deal with the government, the provincial government's mega dam project to harvest the rivers in the James Bay area, that as they got politically active and started to meet with the government officials, they did get a high-level meeting with the premier of the day, Robert Bourassa. And I remember him. I was around when he was very active in Quebec and Canadian politics. And going about it in very traditional ways, opening statement in their native tongue in Cree, and then they were going to start a dialogue and exchange gifts and do all the ritualistic things that were important for them. And before their five-minute opening statement was translated, Premier Bourassa stood up, slammed his book shut and said, I don't have time for this, and walked out. And, I mean, that just emblematizes the colonialist attitudes in Canada and elsewhere that held these wonderful people back for so long and still does, that they're actively fighting against. So the book is not absent of politics, but focuses on how these communities survived and, as best they could, thrived. And so that same chapter has delightful portrayal of the Fort George Rockers that formed in the early 70s and performed all over the James Bay area and talks about a rock tour by canoe. Kind of, kind of a bunch of sexy guys, I think. And they're still performing now in 2020. You can look them up on YouTube. The Fort George Rockers. Many, many joyful anecdotes and vignettes like that. And I want to close by telling you that I have fallen in love with a photograph and then with the artist that the man in the photograph became, thanks to this book. I have done my best with the man's first name. I have not found any help online, but I think I've got his surname down pat. His name is Kananganak Patuguk. Kananganak Patuguk. He was an Inuk man in around 1958 when this photograph was taken. And he lived in what was then called... Hey guys, well it's a few months later, I'm editing this review and I was mortified to see how badly I massacred the name of the town he was from in two languages. The colonial name of the town was Cape Dorset and it has now been renamed by its true name, the Inuit name, Kanait. Here's the spelling, so the pronunciation of Kanait is not intuitive. There you go. But I didn't do so bad in the first try with the Inuit name as I did. I think I called it Dorset Bay or something. So he was from Cape Dorset, now known as Knight. Let's get back to my review. And he became a fabulous artist. So here is the picture that made my heart go pitter-pat. Isn't he cute? <laughs> so cute. 1958. And I'm going to read a page. I'm going to read the page that's on that, that talks a bit about the photograph. And this was taken. The photograph was taken by a, I believe she was a Brit. I can't remember now, but I think she was a British woman living in the north of Canada, Rosemary Eaton. Kananganak Patuguk poses for Rosemary Eaton in what is likely 1958. His father, Joseph Patuguk, was a respected man and one of the first in the region to convert to Christianity. Previously, he had held out for quite a long time, telling visiting missionaries, We have shamans, we're fine. But it is rare to talk to a hunter in the Arctic who has not had a close call. Joseph once fell into the icy ocean on a hunting trip. It's a big test. The ones who have the wits and luck to get themselves out are alive. The rest are gone. Joseph was in dire straits. He was wearing caribou skin clothing, which soaked up the water and made him heavy as an anchor. He said, Okay, if you get me out of this one, I'm yours. Whether through luck or divine intervention, he somehow got himself up onto the ice and out of the water. He took off his clothes and wrung them out. It was then vital to get his clothing back on before he perished from the cold, and to let his own body's natural heat dry out the caribou skins. Patuguk eventually walked a great distance to where his people were, 
and the story goes, said, We're going to build a church, an Anglican church. In the photograph, Kananganak Patuguk's parka is perfectly tailored by his mother, Ningiokuluk. She clothed the whole family and was very proud of their place in the community, reflected in their fashion and her work. The coloring and stitch work of the parka are exquisite, as is the fur ruff of the hood. The Patuguk men, father and son, also broke new ground in taking up printmaking and the arts, a vocation some in Kenite viewed as a questionable activity for men. Kananganak was to become a mainstay of the print shop, cutting stone blocks for carving and encouraging other men to take up the chisel, pencil, or brush and work in the studio. In the photo, Kanganganak is looking at Eaton with a kind of cryptic gaze, observed John Houston, a kind of expression that shows his self-confidence, a look of amusement, and a slightly sly smile, as if his brain is working overtime. Some years later, Kanganganak would make the famous print entitled The First Tourist, a satiric commentary on tourists from the South. But at this time, Kanganganak was just on the verge of becoming a powerhouse in the Kenite Arts Cooperative, with his art soon to achieve national and international fame. Perhaps the photo captures a moment of self-realization, his thoughts full of images, ideas, and a growing self-assuredness in his artistic skills. A young man discovering a creative path in his life, a new journey. So, Kanganganak Putuguk, my new favorite artist, I fell in love with his photo as a young man, and then I fell in love with his art. And that is just one of the many delights in this book. So if any of this sounds good to you, you must check out Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun by Paul C. Sequasis. Thanks for watching. Thank you.